Well, as you make your way back to your seats, we're not discouraging you. Loving somebody is just a you love each other a lot. That's that's amen. While you make your way back to your seat, uh, let me just say maybe for those who are watching our web stream uh, or those who might uh, watch this later via our website, uh, do not change the color on your screen. Uh, you don't have to do that because uh, I am this red this morning uh, from yesterday's uh, outreach initiative at our new uh, our new 11th Street building, our North Side uh, Community Center, and I am this red. Somebody didn't bring a hat for me to wear, and uh, black asphalt, and warm sun. Uh, well, this is what you get. The other thing you don't have to adjust your screen for is uh, this is the true color of this T-shirt. It is uh, kind of between a blue and a teal, and this is our new church T-shirt. Pastor Gary, thank you excellent design. Let's give him a big hand of appreciation. And uh, I'll use any excuse to wear a t-shirt to church. <laughs> and uh, you'll see several of these around. Uh, no, this isn't the same one that I wore yesterday. I didn't have time to wash that one. I, I love these shirts so much I bought two. Thought I would wear one today to be a support. Uh, Pastor Carissa before service. I think somebody will be in the foyer after service to sell these t-shirts. Uh, they start at five dollars and go up. The larger you are, uh, the more money it costs you to be larger. And uh, don't I know? Amen. And uh, if, if you want to get a t-shirt out in the, in the foyer after service, they will be there. Again, they start at five dollars. And just to let you know, we're just offsetting the cost of our t-shirts. That's not what we paid for them. But we want to try to bless you and, and get all those who want a t-shirt, t-shirt. So help yourself after service and pick up these t-shirts. Pastor Gary uh, yesterday had a, a new t-shirt designed as well for the foundry. I suppose you might even be willing to sell a few of those if some parents or grandparents want to come and bless the foundry youth ministry with a t-shirt. You can do that as well. They're a nice gray with a big bright orange in the center for all of you who like nice big bright colors. Uh, you can get those t-shirts from him I think as well. And let me just say before we go to God's Word today, what a wonderful, wonderful day we had yesterday at the Northside <laughs> Community Center. Yeah. I... I probably have more to say than you have time to hear, but we were just uh, able to see many, many, many new faces. I don't know. I, if I were guessing, I, I think at some point I, I knew there was 90 to 100, and, and I'm sure it went on before there because people were starting to trickle in before 1 o'clock and, and well after 3 o'clock. But we fed uh, folks, and their children played on the inflatables, and... Uh, information was given out. We had our connection cards that you have in the pew or the church chair in front of you. We, we had those cards and we gave away uh, free chief tickets to um, three different families. We're blessed in a draw that we did. Uh, they were just, uh, just ecstatic to get those tickets. And probably to me was something I heard last night before my eyes slammed shut. My wife mentioned to me uh, an email that she received just thanking God that we weren't there just to have fun, we weren't there just to feed uh, you know, our neighbors, uh, but we also had a tent with two big signs on it that said, or asked the question, want prayer. And there might not have been a whole lot of folks go by way of the tent for prayer, but there were some. And some of the things that happened, and, and I'm gonna probably miss several, but I know that there was uh, one person that came in um, with back pain and was healed under the prayer tent yesterday. Uh, yeah, give the Lord some praise. That's, that's wonderful. Amen. Another testimony was a, a precious woman who came in just completely overcome with stress, things happening in her life, and she was prayed for in the prayer tent. And when she left, you know, just that feeling of stress and anxiety was lifting off of her, that oppression or whatever it was. And so we thank the Lord for that as well. Amen. God is good. And uh, there were other testimonies. Those are just two that stand out to me. So we want to thank everyone. I'm not going to begin mentioning names because from our staff 
to leadership, to board members, uh, to many of you that are here this morning, from organization to service to knocking on doors uh, the whole week before this happened. I just want to say thank you. Uh, if you're at home uh, or watching this live stream, you know, you can give a little hand clap at home, but I want to say thank you so much. This was a, a small success of many bigger ones to come for North Parkway Assembly of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Not every day is the best day, but we make the best of every day that God gives to us. And we did that yesterday, I think maybe the weather, the inclement, the clouds, people were making other plans. Because normally the park is, there's all kinds of children playing there. When we've driven by or we've been there, there's usually people playing basketball in the park. That, that wasn't happening yesterday. So uh, we know that as we move into the future, some great things happening at Northside uh, Northside Community Center. We're excited about that. I want to go right to the Word today. Matthew chapter 16, if you would. Matthew chapter 16. And we're going to really dive into this chapter today. I, I do want to set a little bit of a foundation. I want to review just a few moments from last Sunday because last Sunday... And I usually do this in the fall of the year. I'm starting a little early this year. But in the fall of every year, I take some time to really cast vision, to talk about, you know, who we are, why we exist, and a little bit about where we're going. And I thought it might be nice on the communion table in front of you and in front of me. Last year, uh, there were three messages that were preached uh, here they were called uh, under God's Classroom. It was a series of messages called God's Classroom. And you might be interested. I, I printed off uh, quite a few. So those are first come, first serve. If you don't get one, let me know. We can print off more. But if you'd like to, to take a copy of that, it, it will share some things that we talked about last year under the, under the acronym Fellowship. And from F-E-L-L-O-W-S-H-I-P, for three weeks, we talked about who we felt God was calling us to be. And we believe that a great church will be highly involved in the Great Commission and will embrace the Great Commandment. And those were a few things that we talked about last year. We talked about being a neighborhood church and how God, we felt, was calling us to love our neighbor. Thank God for mission work that goes on around the globe. Thank God. Come on, somebody. Amen. Thank God for the missionaries that we support. But my goodness, if we give, um, if we give a million dollars to support missions work around this world and we ignore those in our backyard, then I believe that we have committed a biblical error. The Bible teaches us and Jesus taught clearly the resurrected Jesus to a group of disciples that I will make you my witnesses and you'll begin in Jerusalem. This is our Jerusalem. Yes? And this is where we are projecting great vision over the next couple of years. And so we have been talking to you beginning last Sunday morning, a message series for this fall entitled Kingdom Connections. And I spoke a little bit last Sunday about the, the verse in Scripture from Ezekiel chapter 22 that simply says in verse, verse 30, I looked for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land. So God says, I would not have to destroy it, but I found no one. Can I tell you that the spiritual condition of the human family is basically the same today as it was then? In verse 26 of that same chapter, I, I don't have this on the PowerPoint, but I do have a couple of points that we made last Sunday. Verse 26 tells us that there will always be those who claim to be God's people, but they live a double life. They try to participate in the ceremonies of God while sipping from the cup of worldliness and death. And do you know what that does, whether it be during Ezekiel's time or our time today? It's a dimming of the light that God intends to be shined into the darkness of our society and culture. Amen? If God intended us to be a 100-watt bulb when we are participating and, and doing things in a fashion that are not scriptural and biblical, it dims the light. And do you know what the result is of a dimming light? More darkness. And the result of more darkness 
is deceive, deceiving. And the second part of that is a deceiving life. It leaves people lost. Listen, people can't be found unless a light shines upon their path. And, and herein lies the problem. When we as a church, God's people, when the light dims and we're not casting that brilliant light that He wants us to, there are going to be those who will be left in this, this in-between haze. And I think I described it this, this way last week, that the thinking can become uh, very fuzzy and unclear between what's right and what's wrong. And the motto of those and as Americans, I think we can say an amen to this because we've seen this in our own culture here in North America. When this happens, the motto for this group of people becomes tolerance and diversity. These are the slogans for those who are attempting to live without God consciousness. And that is a result of a brilliant light not being cast into darkness. And so we said this based on Ezekiel Scripture, who will stand in the gap? How many of you raised a hand last Sunday and said, I will stand in the gap? Come on, there's more hands. There's hands that were up last Sunday. I will stand in the gap. And we called those who would stand in the gap, we called you kingdom connectors. We asked the question last Sunday, who will answer the call in times such as these? And we understood that God doesn't call the qualified, He qualifies the called. He seeks, He finds, He qualifies, and He sends. Folks, yesterday afternoon, we were sent into the people, into the homes and the lives of people, the north side of this community. And I believe that we were a great blessing. And we can say, continue saying, Lord, send us. Amen? In this second message this morning, I want us to talk about, and I really hope that you'll find this interesting because if you don't, you'll be bored, <laughs> right? I want to talk about the life of a kingdom connector. The life of a kingdom connector. From time to time, Bev, Nathan, I have to be reminded that God chose to place a great treasure in earthen vessels. How many of you here this morning are thankful for the great treasure? When you accepted Jesus Christ into your life, you have a great treasure. Are you thankful for the great treasure? There should be a lot more hands than that this morning, or I'm having an altar call right now for y'all. <laughs> a great treasure. And I have to be reminded that God chooses to use people who are not perfect but have a great treasure in their life. He chooses, and I have to be reminded of that. And I love at times when I need this reminder to read through character sketches of different men and women in the Old and the New Testaments and see just how God displays the imperfection of those who have a great treasure and are used greatly for the Lord. How about some illustrations? Well, sure, I'll give you a couple of them. Probably my two favorite. One is Elijah. Elijah called fire down from heaven, remember? But what happened when he came down from the mountain? He ran <laughs> from, Je from, from Jezebel. That kind of shows me that a man of God can be a man of power, but he can also be a fearful man. A woman of God can be a woman who knows how to pray and see results in her children and her grandchildren's life, but she can also be a woman who has some worries and concerns and fear. David, I think I preached on this a couple of weeks ago. David slays a giant, 10 foot 7, 13 foot 5. The argument still goes on, but he was big. But then... After he slays a giant, Kim, we see him giving in to the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life, and he peers over the palace wall, and he watches Bathsheba as she bathes. What we see here with David is we see a man who hungers after the things of God, but he made some poor life choices. Anybody in this room? Since you first asked Jesus Christ into your heart and into your life, have you made some poor 
life choices? Does the treasure still exist in your life? Has God chosen still to use you? Sometimes we get frustrated with the imperfections that we see in our brothers' and sisters' lives. Don't look around. Just keep looking right up here at me. That's when we need to be reminded, Towries. I'm not perfect, just forgiven. Haven't yet arrived, but I'm on my way. Since Jesus found me and he saved me, can't say that I'm perfect, but I'm on my way. That's an oldie. Amen. It's possible that God gives us this image in Scripture to keep us from worshiping the man more than the God who uses him. We should remember that even at our highest level of spiritual astuteness, we are still filthy rags in the sight of God. Mm -hmm. We must always remember that the contents are way more valuable than the container. But yet how many have been guilty of following the container and when they found out that the container didn't equal the value of the treasure, they give up on the church. They give up on the preacher. They give up on somebody of, of influence and prominence spiritually because they can't handle the fact that we are just earthen vessels that God, each and every one of you, decided to pour a treasure into. I think you're going to find some interesting things here today. This exposure isn't to discredit men or to cheapen God's grace. I want you to hear me and note that today. Don't anybody email me or put a big Facebook splash, you know, that says, oh, the preacher was saying it's okay to live a life of sin. Preacher was saying it's okay. What I am saying is that God chooses Without us cheapening His grace and with no discredit to men and our ability, God's, we are dependent on God. And to really help us today to look at the life of a kingdom connector, I want to look at Matthew chapter 16. I hope that you will turn there to Matthew 16 if you have an old-fashioned Bible with pages. Or if you have an electronic device like I do this morning, if you would just scroll back a page or two or scroll up a line or two all the way up to verse number 13. I don't mind telling you this morning I've got a long road to hoe and a short handle here to get her done this morning, but I believe the Spirit can help us to understand what He's trying to speak to this church today. Could I have an amen there today? I'm going to give you a couple of points, but I'm, I'm going to do something I don't normally do. I, I'm not a verse-by-verse -verse preacher, you know that. I, but I'm going to try to, to bring some things out today that I feel God wants to speak to us through this chapter. But i got to have a couple of points or you'll think it's a pointless sermon, right? Right. Number one, jot this down. Jesus surrounded himself with common people. During Jesus' public ministry, Betty Cooper, many had the privilege of becoming close to Jesus. But even, Rick, in the manifest presence of God through Christ himself, <laughs> there was a doubting Thomas. Disciples jockeyed for positions. There were politics. There were disputings. Matter of fact, there was even a betrayal. And in the midst of those 12, there was a devil. Now, I don't know if we can live by this percentage, but I've often wondered if one out of every 12 people in my life are a... Keep looking right up here at me. Don't look to your left. Don't look to your right. Just keep looking right up here. But I'm just wondering if Jesus could choose a devil to be in his midst. I wonder if we have to be able to have the mind of Christ and the heart of Christ and be compassionate as well. 
Jesus never excused unrighteousness. But we must be cautious that we don't throw out the one in whom God has chosen. Though we are cautious not to be careless with God's grace, and I've said that a few times because I want you to hear it. At the same time, and I think it's very important for those who are just starting out, if you've been serving the Lord, going to church, accepted Jesus into your life less than a year, year ago, then I think it's very important for us to understand that life itself is more like a roller coaster ride than it is a jet plane ride. There's ups and there's downs. There are times when we walk on the mountaintops and we feel like we can call fire down from heaven like Elijah or slay a giant like David. But there's other times when we fall flat on our face. Isn't that right, Kevin Johnson? And we say, oh God, you got to get me out of this one. Amen. Don't raise your hand, but did anybody pray that prayer this week? Oh, thank you, Chris. God, you've got to get me out of this one. Anybody ever just cried out, God, if you don't help me, I don't know what I'm going to do. God, I'm going to, I'm going to have to go to a doctor. I'm going to have to see a psychiatrist. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to bother somebody. I, I'm not sure if I'm even going to make it. I, I may be wanting to take the easier way out because I don't know if I can take this any longer. God, help me. It's something, isn't it, how you and I have similar stories. We can come in here today with all of our spiritual astuteness and looking so good and pretty and so special and have our Bibles tucked neatly under our arms, but yet we can walk in here looking so great on the outside and be a complete wreck on the end. Life for kingdom connectors can often seem like a roller coaster ride. Verse 13, if you're with me today, Nudge your neighbor and say, here we go. Here we go. This won't take too long. I know it seems like I'm just starting my sermon, but I'm, I'm almost two pages in and I've only got four. If that gives you any indication as to what time you're going to get to Chinese buffet today. Verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, you know this scripture well, don't you? He asked his disciples... Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, you say these two words with me? Some say. Mm -hmm. John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Some say. Some say. I think it's amazing here, Tom, that Jesus doesn't argue enlist his credentials <laughs> nor does Jesus Danny remind them of the miracles that have been worked who do people say the son of man is well some say isn't it something I thought about this I wrote a side note I think this is important it, for me today isn't it something that we always want people to know about our excellence or how excellent we are. Hmm? We want people to know how excellent we are when kingdom connectors should be pointing the direction of how excellent Jesus is. Yeah. How excellent the Father is. Jesus didn't defend, he didn't offer suggestions, he didn't give them his credentials. Verse 15. He says, what about you? Who do you say that I am? <laughs> Amazing, Rose, Dan, good to see you guys, by the way. Amazing, isn't it, how, how 11 men say nothing. I know the ladies in here are thinking, doesn't surprise me one bit, doesn't surprise me one bit. 11 men probably ain't got much to say. One man is recorded and has been read for 2,000 years. This story has been, has, been, has been transferred down the lines from generation to generation. 
But 11 men, Ryan, say nothing. I was thinking and praying this week that do you know one of the things killing the church today is the silent majority? Amen. Just want to throw this in here as a kingdom connector. And those of you who feel God is putting you in position to stand in the gap and to be a kingdom connector, let me just say to you today that you have got to know what you believe. If you do not know what you believe when it comes to the issues, I'm not going to go down through the long list, but this is a voting year, and we know that the issues become more prominently spoken about than ever before during an election year. But can I tell you, if you do not know what Scripture says and have your mind up on different issues, whether they be from sexuality or the sanctity of marriage or whatever, can I tell you that somebody else will tell you what you believe? If your children do not have their minds determined and made up as to creation, then somebody else will tell them and teach them to believe evolution. Amen. You have to have your mind made up. Eleven men kind of went... And one man, Simon Peter, verse 16, says, You are the Messiah, the Son of of the living God. This is amazing to me because Larry Shar calling a lot of names today, aren't I? We need to fill in the, the chairs a little more so I'm not so quick to, this is still summer I know and the last push for vacation so good to see you Larry and Shar way back there holding down the back row. <laughs> Powerful, Jesus responds and this is the verse we all like and love to quote. Blessed are you, Simon of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Oh, Pentecostals are just about ready to break out and run around the church right now. Amen. Something incredible happens here. Something spiritually significant I don't think any one of us should overlook. There are some speculations about this verse. Let me just say, you read several commentators and several authors, and you know those who I've always said are a whole lot smarter than I am. But when you read different authors, credible, credible, I shouldn't quote, credible Christian authors, there's different opinions about this verse of Scripture. But some believe that Jesus had yet to even divulge this information. It's very possible. I'm just going to leave it at that. But one thing is for certain, whether Jesus had divulged this information to his disciples or not, the fact of the matter remains that Simon was recognizing something that others did not recognize, and he was speaking something that maybe others were afraid to speak. While some say you're one of the prophets, Simon said you are Messiah. Son of the living God. Can I tell you today, every one of you who raised your hand and believe that God is calling you to stand in the gap and be a kingdom connector. See, can I tell you that oftentimes being a pastor, there's things along with my vocation I am, that, I am, that I need to do, that I have to do. But can I tell you that one of the one of the one of the most wonderful things, one of the most precious things that I, I feel that I have probably done in the last few weeks was being able to stand down here at Northside Community Center and talk to people who are, let's call them pre Christian or pre kingdom people. Because God loved the whole world, right? That He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in them will not perish but have everlasting life. That gives hope for every lost man and every lost woman that walked on our property down here at 11th Street yesterday. There's hope. They're not just lost. They're not just broken. They're not just hurting. They're not just overwhelmed. They're pre Christian. They're pre-kingdom people. They're people that God sent His Son for. And what better thing could we do? If I take the pastor cap off and hang it, hang it on a shelf, I'm a Christian. And as a Christian, outside of this pulpit, outside of that office, outside of these walls, God has called me to connect people to His kingdom. 
and you too. And here's something about you and I, kingdom connectors. We sometimes hear, see, and understand things that the nominal believer can't hear, see, or understand. See, even here this morning, there are going to be those potentially who are going, and I love every one of you in this room. I, I'm, I'm, glad that, I'm glad that not a one of you stayed home today. I'm glad to see everybody here. But just preaching here today and with our growing 60, 75, or 80 who are watching us via our live streaming today, chances are there are going to be some who just aren't really seeing the heart of this message today. There are just those nominal Christians who just don't get it yet. And then there are those who are sitting here today who are like, you're all on board. I mean, you're, you're saying, man, where's the train, preacher? I've got the pass. I'm in for the ride. I want in. Yes, pastor. How many yes pastors are, are here in the room today? And I don't mean just yes pastor to me, but I mean just yes. This is, this is getting into my heart and into my spirit. God's called me to be a kingdom connector. I'm ready. And I'll tell you that there are just things that kingdom connectors see, hear, and feel that nominal Christians don't. Somebody said one time to me and another pastor in town, at least they didn't, they didn't say it to my face, it was a rumor. And the rumor was that you, and I'll pick on them, it was the Church of God pastor in town. He said, you and the Church of God pastor in town are both so narrow-minded that you both could get down on one knee, look out through the keyhole of the door, and see the same thing. That's how narrow-minded you two are. <laughs> I'm going to tell you kingdom connectors who are sitting here today feel you'll hear and you'll understand something that the nominal everyday church as usual reading the Bible as usual doing all the connecting all the dots and keeping everything in line and order the nominal Christian doesn't get to see here and understand it's amazing, this insight. And then this. I tell you, Jesus said, that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades or hell will not overcome it. I would love to spend a little time right here talking theology, uh, but I don't have the time today. But I just want you to know that, that, that in this portion of Scripture, Peter is not the rock on which the church is going to be built. Amen. Now, there are other folks in this room besides myself who have a certain religious past or following where what we would consider what we would consider papal theology comes into play and that has continued on down since the first but let me just tell you something Jesus was not setting and establishing Peter as the rock of the church upon which the church would be built Jesus was answering the question, or should I say the statement, that Peter was making up in verse 16. Jesus asked, well, who do you say that I am? And, and, and Simon Peter said, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And this is what Jesus' response is. A man who is named Simon, Jesus now calls Peter, but then he goes back to Peter's statement and he says, since you recognize that I am the Messiah, the Son of the living God, I will build my church. And on this rock, the gates of hell will not overcome it. He says, I give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, here's something amazing. Follow me here. Follow me here. We're almost done. Wow, I'm on my last page. Woohoo! Shouts I can't control. Verse 20. I love preaching. Verse 20. He ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. <laughs> okay, I want to clear this up. This is not supposed to be the case today. <laughs> for, for, for those of you who, who really, really struggle and you are looking for a scriptural support for maybe your shyness or your lack of being, you know, able to speak with people 
you know, about your faith. This, this is not a justification because this is not, this is not, this is not, this is not for today. He ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Why would he say that? Here's the deal. The unfolding of the life of Christ had to be timed perfectly. It was absolutely imperative that Jesus would not be exposed to the people who would crucify him too early. Are you hearing me today? He needed to surround himself with those who would celebrate his cause and help him to fulfill the mission, especially when things got difficult. Where are you going with this preacher? Well, I think more than ever before in 21st century Western civilized Christianity that you and I as kingdom connectors need to surround ourselves with people who celebrate us rather than tolerate us. Because people around you who just tolerate you, if they don't become a distraction to you personally, they will lead people into your life who will become a distraction to you personally. Jesus said, don't tell anyone, don't tell anyone that I am the Messiah. Hold your peace for now. See, surrounding yourself too frequently or for too long with those who tolerate you will jeopardize what you set out to do for the kingdom. It's so vital to surround yourself with people who celebrate you rather than tolerate you. Here, one last statement on this and I'll move on. People who tolerate you cause you to question. At the end of the day, listen, who could have a bigger bullseye on their back today than me? And I, I don't have one painted on my back. You know, everybody's today wants to be a pastor. Everybody wants to go into the ministry. And I'm going to tell you, you think being a pastor is a cakewalk? With the things that we have to face today? I mean, there are things today, and probably I've said a few of them, that if the right person got a hold of this, I could probably be charged with violating a law. And it's just getting worse. The generational war is just getting broader and broader and bigger and bigger. The more generations that exist and survive and we have within the body of Christ, it just makes it more difficult because there's a struggle for this color and struggle for that color and struggle for that type of music and a struggle for this type of music. And, you know, they're spiritual and they're not and, you know, they're over the hill and we're the now crowd and it just goes back and forth. And as a pastor, you stand like a, like a man in the gap trying to bridge all the groups together saying... Folks, if we're going to do this thing, we've got to love each other and we've got to do it together. Not looking down our nose because one's young or one's old or one's been saved for 40 years or one's been saved for four months. I understand growing in the Lord and Christian maturity, but we've got to recognize we've got to do this thing together. I was getting so gray I had to shave it all off so that I could identify with the younger group. <laughs> yeah. I'm not ready for the seniors ministry yet. No, not yet. Getting close. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he now must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Now remember this guy who started out with the name Simon that he gave the new name to, Peter. Peter takes Jesus aside. I always get concerned after a sermon when people want to talk to me off to the side. <laughs> and, and he says this. Jesus turns and Peter says uh, to him, uh, Never, Lord. This, this shall never happen to you. See, this isn't what Jesus needed to hear. Now, I'm not going to say that, that Peter was one of those that, 
that was tolerating Jesus. But there's something about what Jesus just got done saying that Peter hadn't yet accepted. See, there was something about following Jesus that brought safety, a certain level of spiritual comfort to his life. So Peter wasn't thinking about himself right now or or about Jesus. He was thinking about himself. No, Jesus. No, you you can't go and suffer. You you can't go. No, you can't die. You you can't go to the cross of Calvary on God. No, Jesus. No, no, Jesus. No, Jesus, we like things just the way they are right now. We'd like you here, Jesus. There's so much more for us to learn, greater things for us to understand, more things we want to see, more words from you we want to hear. No, no, no. In the sincerity of his heart, Jesus turns to Peter and says, Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You don't have in mind, are you seeing this? You don't have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Would you just take a moment, if you have your Bibles open, or if you're scrolling Verse number 17, I think this is amazing. If you circle or highlight in your Bible, go ahead and circle the name Simon. And then in verse 18, circle the name Peter. And then in verse number 23, circle the name Satan. And these are significant because isn't it something here, Eric? That in just five verses, one man gets called three names. It's recorded by Matthew that he was Peter, or that he was Simon. And then Jesus calls him Peter. And then we just got done reading, he's now called Satan. Now I know there's different writings and different thoughts on this too, that, that when Peter spoke, that Jesus was speaking to Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Well, that's not the case. Because he identifies here in the same verse of Scripture, in verse number 23... He says, you are a stumbling block to me. Well, he's still talking about Satan here. No. He says to Peter, you don't have in mind the concerns of God, but merely of human concern. Well, you can believe what you want, and you can believe the authors you want, and the commentators you want. I'm going to stick to the ones that I trust the most in study. Because, you know, there have been times in my life when I've probably been called all three as well. And some of you are thinking, who is he going to look at? Because we want to know who in this church is calling the pastor Satan. We want to know there's going to be a gangbang after service. Someone's going to get it because we love our pastor. That's real weak right there. That's a real weak, a real weak amen. And Rick, Donna, I expected you, Norm, Anita, to lead that charge right there of how much you love your pastor. Thank you very much. Simon. You know what Simon means? Unstable. Unstable. Peter. Now, there's some debate on this as well, but we're just going to say Peter means rock. We've got to be careful there because, again, going back to papal theology, that some feel that he's the rock in which the church is built, and that's just not right. But we don't have time to go there today. But it's interesting how he's also called Satan. If you look at this with me, just by way of a graph. And I know this isn't the book of Psalms, but in the book of Psalms, everything gets placed on a scale. There's high notes and low notes. And though this isn't a song or a psalm that we're reading from, I think it's absolutely amazing here how Jesus calls him Simon, unstable. He then, when Simon recognizes something prophetic before him and he gives a prophetic utterance you are the messiah jesus calls him peter so he goes from unstable to rock huh and then in this verse though he says get behind me satan isn't that something simon peter satan would you say that with me simon 
Peter, Satan. One more time. Simon, Ellen, you want to come and join me this morning? Something nice and soft. Maybe that last one we were doing. Breath. I love that song. It's your breath. Mm. In my lungs. Here's the caboose today. You ready for the caboose? It's only 11.52. I'm going to give me two more minutes to preach. Two, four, six, eight, ten. That's all I need. Thank you. That's getting old, isn't it? I know. From unstable and inconsistent, he has a revelation, gets a promotion, and then speaks of him, and then he speaks like a man who forgot his promotion. You ever do that? Anybody here? Saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit. Got a great treasure in an earthen vessel. Woo! Mm. Came to North Parkway Assembly of God. We know we the best church in town. We the perfect church in town. Mm. Yeah. Perfect churches have perfect Christians. Huh? Yeah, well, we always said if you find the perfect church, don't join it because you'll spoil it. Because none of us are. Isn't it something how a Holy Spirit filled, saved, sanctified man can speak or act like someone who isn't? Elijah, David, Peter. Just three simple examples of men with a great earthen treasure or a great treasure in an earthen vessel. But yet they bring some chaos. The words they say, the things they speak. So I ask this question this week, and I'm going to give you the third and final point, and we're going to wrap it up here today. Verse 24, the point is, Jesus' people will be people of the cross. I asked this question. I said, God, what brings chaos to this messed up situation called Darren Shorey? Ooh, I got your attention there. God, what brings chaos to this messed up situation called Danny Woods? God, what brings chaos to this messed up situation called Gary Buchanan? You all put your name in that blank. What brings order to this chaos of a man who, just like Simon, Peter, could speak, act, and do in a way that could compromise our kingdom connection and have Jesus say to us, Son, daughter, that's just not, that's just not the way you ought, you ought to be acting or talking. I'm going to have to say, get behind me, just like I did to Peter. So then verse 24, this is where we began the journey this morning. Jesus said to his disciple, disciples, whoever wants, why don't you read this with me right off the screen or your Bible. Go ahead. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. What was Jesus talking about? Well, I'm glad you asked the question. Here's the key in the caboose. Go back up to verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain his, to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and read those word, words with me and suffer many things. I had a conversation with my wife this week and I said, honey, if there's any one thing that we are guilty of in the raising and the rearing of our children, maybe to the extreme and maybe to the fault, we have wanted our children to be comfortable. Any other parents in this room like that? Come on, we've given our kids electronic devices and iPads and iPhones. I mean, I mean, not everyone can, but those who can. You know, we don't send our kids to school in the generic shoe or sneaker. If we can, we send them with the, the Nike Slash or whatever that's called. Pastor Gary makes fun of me. 
swoosh. You know, because we want them to fit in. You know, all the other kids got Nike swoosh. Is that how you say that? We want you, you know, we, we everything. We may, oh, no, no, no. Dad will mow the lawn. You know, Dad mows the lawn. Mom vacuums the floors. And, you know, and, you know, Mom will vacuum. No, it's okay, honey. You just, you, you go do your thing. And Mom will take care of this. Mom will do this. Mom. We just want our children to be comfortable. I can remember saying to my wife, whenever my, my daughters, and I've got three of them, and, you know, from, from 13 all the way to 24, and one in the middle, well, not quite in the middle. <laughs> She's on the upper end, you know, then the last chance for a boy, and well, we'll talk about that later. And, and I can remember, can you know, we'd be off the church, and one or two of them would be in the back. Crying, I'm trying to get my sermon straight in my head, and all that. I'd say, "Honey, make make her comfortable. What are make her make her comfortable?" And that's what a lot of parents we do. We we just go through life making our children. Well, I, I didn't have, and I I just want my children to have, and I don't want my children to know. But can I tell you something? We have taken from our children the things that have made us great. Knowing how to suffer. There's something to be said about suffering. Anybody who has ever been used greatly by God has endured pain. They've lost something. They've faced tra traumatic situations. They've been in toxic relationships. You've been rejected, ostracized, lonely, and forsaken. Your gift has become tempered in the furnace of affliction. And you became pliable in the master's hand and usable. And a great treasure was placed in an earthen vessel. And that earthen vessel is pliable because you knew and you know how to suffer. And suffering makes us pliable. Why do bad things happen to good people? Because it's more important to God that you be holy than happy. Stand with me this morning. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you. Keep playing all over this place today. Philippians 3.10 The Apostle Paul says, I want to know Christ. To know the power of his resurrection, the participation in his sufferings, to become like him in his death. And so somehow, attaining the resurrection from the dead. Ooh. A test gives you a testimony. I know it's, it's 12 noon right now. Both hands, if that clock had hands, high noon. But I wonder today, there's an urgent call going out in this sanctuary here today. I think I said this a couple of weeks ago, Missy, that the more God breaks our hearts for the lost, the more lost people are going to be found sitting right here on these chairs in this sanctuary experiencing the presence of God and knowing His favor, knowing His presence. Break our hearts, God, for the broken and the lost and the hurting of this community. What makes sense out of the chaos that Darren Shorey is oftentimes subject to pre Darren, Darren, Satan, Simon, Peter. Saint, what, what brings order to the chaos? Dave and Patty Nash. Jesus said, Take up the cross. Those of you in this place, and I want you to hear your pastor today, and I, I'm going to shut this down right here. I have to. I have to. I want you to hear me today. I command Satan in the name of Jesus, in whom I know and I love and I believe, that the woundedness that is keeping you and I at North Parkway Assembly of God, formerly Driven Church and formerly First Assembly, the woundedness that keeps us emotionally, 
spiritually, mentally, and in some cases, possibly even physically. I command that under our feet in the name of Jesus. My pain and your suffering is not going to handicap us and be our liability. We're going to make it our asset. We're going to make it our asset. We don't have to walk around always talking about our pain or our woundedness. But I will tell you, out of the midst of that woundedness, when we recognize the message of the cross, we will grow greater rather than weaker. I remember one little lady, I, I never thought in my life I could ever handle what one little grandma went through with the grandchildren and the children she buried and her passing off her husband and some mess up with her finances and, 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 and her being left with literally nothing from a, from a man who had a lot. I remember her saying to me, in her simple little way, at the age of 75, 80 years old, she looked up at me. I was probably just a 25-year-old preacher. And she said, Pastor, sometimes, sometimes, you just got to let the Lord clip your wings so that you can soar a little higher. Folks, that's taking up our cross and bearing our cross and recognizing how God wants to use us. Here it is. In just a few moments, I'm going to invite the altar team. Matter of fact, you guys can begin to move. Uh, Ryan, Ryan's in the sanctuary this morning. Altar team, Bev, Nate, any others that are here. I'm going to ask this. If you're here today and you need to pray a prayer with somebody because you've put God on the back burner and you need to just move God, <laughs> you need to move yourself a little closer to God and God a little closer to you in your life, then would you come and have one of these wonderful people pray with you? We got a young man here. Whoop, right here. We got a young man for any of you young folk that want to be prayed for. There's a praying man, young man right here. Some ladies and men here that will pray with you. If you need to move God from a back burner to a front burner, if you've been skipping out on things and you've kind of put God at an arm's length, you need to make some things right, come and pray with one of these people. But here, this is what I'm hoping will happen today. I know some of you all might have lunch plans and lunch dates and picnics and, and boating events and fishing and grandchildren and things going on. But, but man, if you could, sir, ma'am, if you could take a few moments. Here's the call today. Okay, these folks are going to pray for those who need to come a little closer to God. But for the rest of us who in this room would say, Lord, you're calling me to be a kingdom connector. You're calling me to stand in the gap. You're calling me to live a life that will shine brilliant on those who are lost and in the darkness of the society. And Lord, today, I accept this. I accept to allow all of my pain, all of my heartache, all of my woundedness, whether it came to me, out of my control or maybe something done to me purposely or just because I ended up in the wrong place at the wrong time, I'm going to use all of that as, as cross stuff and I'm going to use it to being the best kingdom connector that I possibly can be. Help me to bring it all in a big, big bag and lay it here on this altar today and to reach out my hands to you and say, Lord, here am I. Use me. Use me, Lord. I want to be a kingdom connector. I want to be one who will stand in the gap and connect people to the kingdom, even through my pain. I'll suffer. I'll bring it to the cross. In Jesus' name. I don't care if heads are bowed and eyes are closed today. If you don't, how many would come? I'm going to move because I'm coming. And you'd come and you'd stand somewhere in this place today. If you can't, if you feel like you can't come or you can't stand here today, maybe just right in your seat, you'd lift your hand. But I wonder how many would come and stand right here all across. You can kneel on an altar. You can kneel at a bench if you want. I wonder how many kingdom connectors do we have in the house of God today? Come on, just begin to fill this altar. Kingdom connectors connectors. How many of you would be willing to even bring your woundedness and suffering and pain and lay at an altar and say, I'm tired of this getting in the way. I'm going to use it. I'm going to use it. The asset to the advantage 
of being a preacher and a teacher of the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Come on, fill this altar today. If there's any tug at your heart at all, be obedient to that tug, will you? Whether you kneel or you stand or you sit in the front, you can sit back where you are, it's fine, but, but do something. But reach up to heaven, lift a hand, tilt your face up to heaven and just speak to the Father today. Lord, here I am, 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 here I am. If you're here today and need to make things right with God, Come have one of these wonderful prayer people pray with you. Come on, keep coming. The Holy Spirit pricks your heart, speaks to your heart, gives you a little kick in the heart. Come, come, just come and stand. Come and stand. Come and stand. Just come and stand. Are there any more Kingdom Connectors? Come on, huh? any more Kingdom Connectors in the house today? Well, Pastor, there's 25, 35, 45 feet between me and the altar. That's okay. Jesus bridged the gap between heaven and hell. I'm going to stand. I'm going to stand today. I'm going to stand today. Kingdom connectors. Come on. Just keep coming. Just keep coming. As the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart, just keep coming. Just keep coming. I see things. I hear things. I understand things, preacher. Maybe the normal, nominal, average, everyday churchgoer doesn't get to experience, understand, see, or hear. That's because you're a kingdom connector. I have these things happen. They're like extrasensory. I, I don't always understand it. I Kingdom connector. Kingdom connector. I sometimes look at people, whether they be a brother or sister in the Lord or someone maybe I go to work with, it's lost. And I, I, I almost can... It's like their life opens up like a book before me. I can, I can see things. I can hear the gift of the Spirit. They're operational. You're a kingdom connector. Eric, come and lead us in that song this morning. Come on, hang, hang for a while if you can. Hang for a while if you can. Ten past twelve. If you can, just hang for a bit. If anybody else wants to come to the altar, there's no hurry here today. You just come, just come. Just come. I'll stand in the gap. You are light. I'll stand in the gap. You are love. I'll stand in the gap. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. 